Time to tantalize your earbuds with creative makers and shakers. It's Creative Living, the podcast with Jane Klaus. Welcome to Creative Living, where every episode is a tapestry of imagination and innovation. And I'm your host, Jane Klaus. Thanks so much for joining us today. Now, Creative Living is so much more than just a name. It's a philosophy, and it's a celebration of creativity in its many, many forms. And in every episode, we get to hear from the people who help us uncover the trends that shape the creative industries. And also, we get to learn how they're making significant impacts in their own creative fields. So for anyone who loves the intersection of fashion, storytelling, and creativity, well, you're in luck, because today we are weaving together the magical world of costume design and the practical charm of sewing. My guest today, Amanda Tadaro, is a beacon of brilliance when it comes to sewing education and costume design. Amanda is a master craftswoman who spreads her expertise through freelance costume design and fabrication, and her patterns don't just lay the blueprint for beauty. They're woven with the threads of functionality. Now that's true, like integrating lights and special effects and those breathtaking quick changes that all of us in the audience leave us spellbound. So with a treasure trove of experience managing a costume shop and designing for over 100 theatrical productions, Amanda has dressed stories in their best from a subtle whisper of a hemline to the bold statement of a corseted silhouette. And then, turn left, when the curtains of the theater industry drew closed during the pandemic, well, Amanda spun new dreams into a reality with fabric design and sewing education. And now, Amanda is here to share her pattern of success with us. So thread your needle and ready your bobbins as we unravel the secrets of costume design and celebrate the craft that stitches the seams of imagination and reality together. Amanda Tadaro is a creative person you need to know. I'm so happy to say hi to Amanda Tadaro. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Jane. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited because I love costume design. When I found out you were a costume designer, I was like, oh, I mean, I love I, I love education. I love fabrication. But costume design to me is so fun and special because a lot of us sewists, I grew up wanting to be a costume designer, so I'm excited to kind of go through your journey and maybe get some inspiration on how we can help others who thought, well, maybe I can do this too, or how to maybe even get a little bit more playful with our sewing, right? So let me ask you this first, because the show is called Creative Living. What does creativity mean to you? Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, because I went into the costume field, I got to say like, to me, it's all about problem solving. I think someone who's creative is someone who sees a problem, can visualize how they want to fix it or how they want to go about it, and then we'll just try it. And I think that's what creativity is all about, is just trying it and knowing you may fail, but then you might try something else. So I think creative people tend to just go for things and try things, and they're not really worried about the outcome. Maybe they have an idea of what it's going to look like in their heads, uh, but I think it's that getting to play with that and not being scared to like fail or shift uh, and just being like, you know, excited yeah, to totally. see what you're going to, what you're going to go. Do. <laughs> I always say there's no way you can make a mistake when you're being creative, because if you had intended it to go one way and it totally does not go that way, we'll just look at it as a creative left-hand turn and then you turn it into something else, right? Absolutely. And I think creative minds are okay with that shift and will even welcome it to be, like, you know what, L that didn't work out, but let's try this other way. And it actually turned out better. So I think we're open to yeah. that process and that journey. It always does. Although I do have a rolling rack full of like half finished clothes. Cause like, oh, it turned turn out how I wanted it to be. <laughs> and I'll move on to the next thing. So let me ask you this, because we're talking about creativity. What creative mm -hmm. project are you currently working on? Oh my goodness. I know it's um, tough. It's tough when we all have regular jobs too. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
while I'm working for, I'm creating some garments for Ditto because that's what my full-time job is, is sewing, uh, Ditto sewing projector and creating things for that. Um, but outside of that, I'm focusing a lot on making my own sewing patterns. So I'm kind of shifting into that. So I'd say that is my focus currently. Is I love it. Creating my own clothes and my own designs, which is something I haven't had the time or the brain space to do. So it's an exciting new venture for me. <laughs> it sure is. Okay. So let's take it. Let's go to the Wayback Machine and let's talk about what fueled your passion for sewing. And then when did you know that costume design was really your calling? All right. So we're going to go real far back. <laughs> so uh, my mom sewed when I was a kid. Uh, I remember her making all of my clothes. So a sewing machine was always in the house. She's a huge quilter. So there was always like bits of fabric that I could play with or, you know, get crafty with. Um, I was always making things out of clay. I So I just always was a creative kid. Um, and then I never thought you could do this as a living. Like I didn't think being creative was something I could do as a grown up. Um, so I was just trying to see what other things I could do. I thought about graphic design, kind of like how can I use my creativity, but in a smart, more like business way. Um, so that was one part of it. The other part of it that you'll see this is all coming together mm -hmm. <laughs> in high school. Uh, I was extremely shy and it was suggested that if I did drama club, that might help me with my shyness uh -huh. and nothing gets you out of your shell than a bunch of high school <laughs> drama kids. So, uh, so that's where my kind of the love of theater came. Like I always had that sewing thing. Uh -huh. I always was creative. Uh -huh. I was always into arts and crafts, but it wasn't until high school when I got into the drama club that I was like, Ooh, theater is really cool. And I will tell you, I should not be singing or dancing. So, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I feel you on that so, one. <laughs> yeah. So I found that uh, backstage is where I belong. Um, and that's how I got into costumes. My first show that I costumed, I think, was in high school. And I think it was called The Dinosaur Musical. Um, and I just had a really good time playing with patterns and prints. And I realized, you know, with costume design, your world expands. It's not yeah. just what's fashionable. It's not what's trendy. It's whatever you want that world to be. And mm. I really fell in love with that. And uh, that's kind of how things got started for me. And so fun too, because, you know, in, in theater and in high school, it's like you're in, you have to make the costumes, you have to make the sets and you're probably like, well, who's going to make the costume? Now, I think nowadays they travel like they're traveling theater productions and they drop everything off. But back then, you were like, I have a sewing machine. I can do it. Right. Still is that way. So. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times are being made. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's easy. I can make that. So, <laughs> you know, when we talk about getting creative and making clothes and or costumes, it comes into inspiration. But is there a personal favorite sort of technique or style that you find yourself returning to because you really like it? You mean sewing or just like designing or all I of think, it? <laughs> I think it's in general. So like, you know, for example, it could be just a style. And maybe, you know, when you're doing your costume design, it's kind of dependent on what that production is about. So let's lean into sewing or pattern making or, or something that you're thinking. Oh, I always go back to this because it's kind of my signature. It's my thing. Sure. Um, When I'm... I would say when I'm sewing, I really love structured garments. So Ooh. I love jackets. I love things with interesting details on a jacket, you know, like a coat with a longer back. And I think that's a little bit of my theater background coming in, like the drama of it. Um, so I like taking classic like looks. And again, coming from costume world, like you take your research, you start with something you've seen before. Maybe it's a historical research or a reference, and then you add your own touch. So I think that's very my style overall is here's this classic thing. Let's add some flair to it. Let's add, you know, a longer back or a fun sleeve or a button detail, something that's like maybe a little historical or maybe just different. So do you find yourself when you have like somewhere to go, or you're going, I mean, listen, nowadays I'm wearing sweatpants, but <laughs> when I go out and I have to look fancy or pretty or just be dressed, do you find yourself wearing some of your sort of theatrical costumey clothes that you made? You're like, no, they had the longer back. 
I'll add the longer back to this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, when I have an event to go to, I like to make something for myself. Um, cause it gets me excited and inspired. Um, and you can never add too many clothes to your closet. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm like, my closet's like doubling. And I'm like, why is my closet doubling? I'm like, oh, I've been making all these clothes. And what am I doing? I just leave them in there. But it is fun. <laughs> I'm just like you. If I have an event to go to, and this is kind of sorry and sad, I'll start the outfit at the very beginning of the morning, say the events on a Saturday. And I will sew all day till I have a massive ball gown and I wear it at night. And I'm like, why am I doing this? What am I doing? But then when you go to the party and everyone's like, wow, that's amazing. Where did you get it? And you go, I made it myself. Then you're like so fancy and special. Yep. <laughs> you probably exactly. have a little bit more planning, right? Yours is done weeks in advance. Uh, <laughs> mostly. I'm definitely a planner, but I will say my last vacation, I like got up at like two in the morning before our flight to finish a bathing suit I wanted to make. So I, I'm, I'm, I do it too. <laughs> You're fine. Wow. Two in the morning <laughs> pre-vacation. That's adding a lot of stress yeah. to your life. <laughs> I think I was just excited too. I had to do something with my hands. So. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So you talked about, you know, doing the research and, you know, if you're researching a historical figure for a certain, you know, theatrical production or perhaps your life, um, when you're looking for inspiration for a production or for a pattern, is it mm -hmm. based on historical reference or is it based on personal experience and personal preference? Completely dependent. Like when I'm doing a production, if it is a historical you know, piece, like it's set in a specific time and location, then I will do a ton of research, um, looking through a lot of, like, I have a ton of books on, you know, the fashion history and different eras. Um, and also, you know, the, the online world is huge now, so you can get a lot of research that way, but yeah, I'll do a lot of research, um, into a time period and place and go from there. If it's something that doesn't really have any historical reference, then I get to kind of do more fun stuff. And I think it's a lot of paying attention to the actual character and what that character needs and trying to put your brain into that character and what would they wear? Why would they wear it? Things like that. So it's really, it's kind of, you go two directions depending on how the theater production starts and in what direction you should head. Yeah. So to explain that. So how do you go about translating the character's personality into the costume design? Do you talk to that character, that actor, the director, or are you, you know, really thinking, okay, what is this whimsical fish need to look like? Or this like, you know, gilded age woman wearing because she's the mother of the house. Like, do you have to get into that character? Yeah. And I'll usually when you start the process, like after you're hired right away, you start talking to a director and kind of see what their thoughts are first on in what direction, because you might be doing something completely historical, but they might be like, we're doing a different spin on it, or we're setting this 1920s show in the future. So you kind of have to see where you're starting and get some like base points. Um, but yeah, it's talking to a director. And then, you know, a lot of costume designers, they want to start creating their own idea of this world in their head based off of that. So that's next step is kind of adding your own spin to that. You are the designer. So you are designing something. Uh, and then, yeah, in fittings, um, also talk to the actors and see, you know, how they're playing it, how they shifted it from what was on the script. Um, so it, it kind of evolves and there's a lot of hands in it um, to kind of show you like how you get from. Yeah. The, the, who this person is on paper to who you get to see when you go to see a show. So do you then, once you talk to the director, you kind of put your spin on it. Do you draw it out in, you know, in like a, a mood board or something first, and then you get the AOK -okay and go for it and then tweak along the way? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll sometimes do a mood board for each person, maybe even a mood board for each scene. So there might be 20 mood boards for one character. Um, and then sometimes you'll draw them. So, uh, you know, a lot of people have seen costume renderings, um, same thing as a fashion rendering. It's kind of a drawing of what this thing is going to look like. And sometimes you'll do a rendering for everything. Sometimes you'll just do it if you're going to have that made. So you, you know, if it doesn't exist, you can't point to a picture and be right. say, Hey, make this. <laughs> so you would draw it out to show someone, Hey, we're going to make this, or this is what is in my brain that I want to show you, this is what I think it's going to look like. So there's a combo of both, but yeah, mood boards are definitely an always. <laughs>
<laughs> so you know how sometimes writers get writer's block and they're like, ah, I got to step away for a day, a week, uh, whatever it is, a couple hours. Do you ever get designer's block? Absolutely. And sometimes you just don't get a character. Like mm. sometimes, you know, when you're, you're not always designing you, you're designing, you know, I'm Amanda in my thirties, you know, <laughs> costume designer, but I might be designing like, you know, a 70 year old man who lives elsewhere, right. you know? So, um, you kind of have to try to think through that or you talk to people like, you know, a director might have a better sense of who this character is than you are. So being open to that guidance, being open to what the actor thinks this character is, and then doing research. Um, so yeah, sometimes you, you do block. <laughs> I just made <laughs> you, you block right there. Yeah. I was like, uh, <laughs> like um, I have blocked you, thinking about the blocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you kind of, you talk to people and you just keep looking at research and you, you kind of just keep going through right. that block because a production is going to happen. So it's not like a point right. where you can try to push it off. Maybe like <laughs> that 70 year old man can't go out there with no pants on. He's got to exactly. have something on the bottom. So it's going to happen no matter you have exactly. a block or not, you're going to figure it out. Have you felt like some of the costumes you've designed over the years have impacted the performances of the actors you've worked with? Absolutely. Like I, I think a lot of actors and again, not an actor, but I've been told mm -hmm. that a lot of times they don't feel like that person until they put the clothing on. So a costume mm. really does set, I think it like finishes, it's the cherry on top. It may be more than that, but <laughs> the cherry and the fudge, but it really, uh, you know, it puts them in and sprinkles and puts them in that world um, and just helps them that extra step. But I, yeah, a lot of actors have said that's, that's really what gets them to that point is once you get into dress rehearsals and you're getting to wear those clothes, wear those shoes, like even shoes can mm -hmm. change how an actor feels about the character they're playing and be like, yes, these shoes feel like so-and-so. So That's great. I, I go to a lot of theater. Uh, I'm in Chicago and I go to a lot of theater here. We have season tickets to a theater. And sometimes I look at the shoes and I'm like, well, those shoes don't match that era or that <laughs> year. I'm like, what? who did that? But, but it's interesting that you bring up the shoes too, because do, are all of, Obviously, shoes you're going to find and buy them and distress them or turn them into? Or is there like a place that makes the shoes or do you design the shoes and have them made? And then that goes along with if you're wearing um, a garment that you can just find at a thrift store or it's in your closet, do you go ahead and design it? Or can you just sort of use other clothing that you may find elsewhere? Yeah. So, oh, lots to unpack. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with shoes, it's all dependent on the production. Like if it is a musical, um, there may be roles where they have to be dance shoes and you can actually get dance shoes that look like other shoes. Say you're doing a period piece. You might actually, it might look like, you know, I'm talking too deeply into historical stuff for those that might not know, but you've seen those shoes that button up. Yeah. So you might think, okay, those aren't danceable, but you can actually get dance shoes that look like that, but they're actually ballroom shoes kind of in a way. Uh -huh. So shoes are kind of, it depends if they're dancing, that's a whole different type of shoe. If they're not dancing, then yes, you can just pick them up at the store, um, Amazon, wherever you shop, <laughs> um, and just order shoes. Uh, we distress them, we paint them, oh, you know, okay. I'll, I'll buy brand new sneakers and then basically ruin them to make them look like they've been owned for a long time. So that's certainly an option. And then when you get into clothes, it's all dependent. If it doesn't exist in the world, then yes, you might have someone make it. And that also is budget dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, you may thrift something, you may just purchase it online. Um, or a lot of theaters have stocks. And I know even with movies, there's places, warehouses of costumes mm -hmm. that have been used previously. So when you're designing in the beginning, you usually just start making your mood board based on what you like. And then you'll kind of confirm you can all find it or you can build it before committing. So when you talk to a director, you can be like, hey, we really like this. Uh, what do you think? And they're, they might gravitate towards one dress. And then you'll say, well, that's something I actually found online. So it's purchable, purchasable, easy to get, or that's something we're gonna have to make. So we might have to budget differently, or that's not in the cards, but we can do something that's similar. So it's again, all dependent on the era right. and 
who you're designing for and what the story is and what the budget is. It I love all depends it. How you get all these things. It just sounds like you're planning a party. It's like a social event <laughs> in your head for these costumes and everyone's getting together. You're going to find out how to get them together. Talk a little bit about managing costumes for children's theater and how that differs maybe for adult theater or if it doesn't. So yeah, I love children's theater just because I think there's less rules. Like you get to do whatever you want. You have a lot more fun with yeah. patterns and color and silliness. And I think takes the pressure off. Uh, and kids are just really great in theater. Like they, they will, if you give them a story, they will play along a hundred percent. So that's why I love children's theater. But uh, I think the, the way of managing them are very similar. Uh, you were talking about sounds like a party. Yeah. It's there's parts of it's not glamorous. There's a lot of spreadsheets and there's a lot of budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, children's theater specifically, um, there is a difference because the high school age kids are not professionals. So you, you know, you can't really have that conversation of what have you worn in the past? What works for you? All what right. do you need your pants to do when you're dancing? They might not have that background information while a professional actor will be like, I always split my pants or yeah. like, I know I'm doing this move and I'd really like to be able to do this in my pants or I don't see my act my character wearing that. Yeah. Um, but kids are just, uh, just kind of excited. So there's again, a lot more of that fun. Um, and I think you do deal with things like this is itchy Yep. and because there's less risk, uh, you just change it. You find something else. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's all just fun though. <laughs> the last couple of years, I was able to play Mother Ginger in the Nutcracker, or the Art oh, cool. Deco Nutcracker. Yeah, it's an A and A ballet company in Chicago, and so they let me play Mother Ginger. Obviously, Mother Ginger just is usually a man, but I I do it. I put on a lot of makeup. I stand on a platform and and just go up there and and you know move my arms around. So not a big role in a ballet. But the costuming, because it's all kids, is just spectacular. And I typically sit in the room with the costume designer and all the kids are coming out like, I need to fix this. Can you fix this? I need this. I need that. So it's just fun to be around. And, you know, the costume designers just sort of just take a deep breath and just go ahead and fix it. So you could pretty much fix anything at a moment's notice. Absolutely. And you get really creative. I don't I think what people don't realize when they see a theater production is how much how it looks from afar compared to how it is close like if you've been in shows you know <laughs> the inside of your costume it's Rack. it's kind of like a movie yeah. set where the back of it is just it's all yeah. bare bones structure while the front is a facade and costumes a lot of the times are the same way where it looks beautiful on the outside and the inside is it's all about what the structure and what it needs to be there's rarely yeah. any lining right um so yeah and things rip all the time. People are ripping pants and zippers like mid show and somebody has to fix those before they get back on or you got to grab something new and get creative. So it really keeps you on your toes. But yes, people ruin things all the time and you just keep going. And sometimes it's just um. a safety pin and some duct tape and you got it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> One of the cool things in costume design is for television and you designed some costumes for Dancing with the Stars. Was that exciting? How was that experience for you? And can we see some more of that? Because that's just <laughs> glamour, right? Yeah. So that was a weird, not a weird, that was a very exciting um it was right out of college. So I had no experience wow. real, other than my college experience. And I actually submitted my designs in a contest. I don't uh -huh. know if Dancing with the Stars does it anymore, but they used to have a costume contest. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd submit your drawings of your, the costume and people vote online and, uh, you know, see what happens. And I actually won and they ended up building the costumes I had drawn and had them on an episode. Um, I think it was season nine. I don't know. This was quite a long I mean, time ago. Were you over the moon? That's pretty cool. It was very exciting. And because that was like very, I mean, I was what, 21 years old. So right. huge. Um, and my mom came with me to watch the show and it was, you know, very exciting. Um, but since then, like I, my focus has been on theater productions live in Philadelphia. Um, that's where I live. And I've worked at many theaters there um, as a stitcher, as a designer, as a manager. So I've really put my focus into that. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's super cool to say, I did this for Dancing with the Stars, but I'm doing this instead. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there one of the most memorable behind the scenes moments from any of these hundred theater productions that you've been a part of? Uh, recently, uh, about two summers ago, I was doing SpongeBob the Musical, which mm -hmm. if you've never seen it, Squidward obviously needs multiple legs. And that is some engineering for any costume designer. So I actually built this actor a pair of legs that come off the back of him. Um, and I built like joints in them and all kinds of things so he could dance. And I highly recommend if anyone, if you want to understand what I'm talking about, definitely check out a YouTube video of Squidward in SpongeBob the Musical. But he really does look like a four-legged person. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and he dances. He tap dances in these legs. And that engineering of figuring out how the legs work and all that was, I mean, the coolest thing I think I've ever done, but also yeah. the most stressful. And I will say opening night, one of the feet of one of the back legs came out of the shoe. Oh. <laughs> and so the, the effect didn't work. And I think I was, I was pretty devastated for the day, but again, yeah. then you have a show the next day and it went perfectly. Right. So like, that's what live theater is. You kind of have to just keep going and laugh it off and, uh, other people will see it work perfectly. And some people didn't even see it. So I think that you're fine with that, but I get it. We, exactly. you know, you're like, oh, it didn't work to anyone. Yeah, I know it yeah. because you move on. So let's talk about the pandemic pivot. Uh, I yeah. mentioned it in the open theater shut down across the country. Um, we all had to shift and make pivots and, and do, I was broadcasting out of my home, but you know, like in making a, a studio just so I could stay on the air. I like to call it for you, perhaps like a, you reinvented yourself. You have all these amazing skills. Theaters are closed. And you said, well, I'm going to go do this. You started teaching, mm -hmm. you're designing fabric. What happened? Like, what was that flip like in your head? Um, well, yeah. So theater shut down first. I mean, it was like the first thing to close and the last mm -hmm. thing to come back because you mm -hmm. can't put a ton of people in a room to just breathe. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I was sent home and, um, for a couple weeks, I kind of just enjoyed the downtime because theater is hard. If you, if you've been in shows, it's a lot of hours. So yeah. I enjoyed, some of the just quiet time and resting and playing animal crossing and hanging out <laughs> with my cats. Um, and then I started to, you know, think of what I could do to keep my days busy. And obviously because I sewed, I got into mask making. Um, right. I probably, I teamed up with a local hospital to make masks for them. I made masks for my, the theater I'd worked at. So I was donating a ton of masks and then I started selling them as well. Um, cause that was when you couldn't get masks. Right. So, and I actually designed my own mask and then posted the pattern online for people to use. Um, just like a well-fitting mask. I'm pretty, pretty proud of it. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so I made masks and that kept me busy for a while. Um, and then something I had always wanted to do was learn Adobe illustrator and, you know, digital yeah. art. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I realized like I have this downtime, I should use it. So I taught myself illustrator. Um, and the way I actually learned was I was just looking online at videos and I found someone who does fabric design and I actually learned Adobe illustrator by watching fabric design videos, which then made me want to do fabric design. <laughs> so I, I started it. making a ton of fabric repeats and then started cold emailing companies, my art and saying, Hey, I drew this. Do you want it? And I actually got a fabric licensing deal. So I have fabric that is out. Uh, well, I think at this point it's discontinued because that was a couple of years ago, but mm -hmm. um, QT fabrics, I had a line of nice. cat quilting fabric. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah. I love cats. Oh, I well, do too. <laughs> I know. You said you mentioned your cats. I was like, oh, we could talk about cats. Two girls talking got, about cats. No, no, we're two not. Cats and a dog. So, but yeah, no so offense to the dog, it. but we do love the cats. Um, but then weren't you also selling on Spoonflower as well? Yep. So I post my designs on Spoonflower. Um, so I love Spoonflower. You can Spoonflower. go there to, to see my fabrics and um, you can get wallpapers there. But yeah, it's it gave me a really good creative outlet to just, and it was safe at the time when you couldn't go be with right. people to just be drawing, being on my computer, moving things around, making these beautiful art that I could send out or just post onto Spoonflower. So how does fabric design differ from costume design? 
I think it's similar in the sense that you start with an idea and then you have to do a little research. You know, I want to make a flower print. I've got to look up pictures of flowers as a reference, or I want to make something with woodland creatures. So I should look up pictures of bears and foxes. So it's similar in the sense that you do that research. Um, but then I think there's even more like whatever comes to mind, you just put on paper, but you don't have to find it in a store. So it differs in that way where it's done once you, uh, you draw it. It's um. forever. You can get it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I mean, by the way, Spoonflower, ding, ding, we're giving them a little promo, but it's so fun because you could get anything. If you like your print, you go and you can get it in wallpaper, you can get it in a comforter, you can give it in fabric. It's just so much fun. And I love yep. that. I, I see the fabric designers. I'm like, how do they do that? But it's interesting. You taught yourself Adobe and you learned how to do it and now you're doing it and it goes, mm -hmm. it falls right in line with, you know, sort of your experience and who you are and what you do. Um, I'm, literally obsessed with sustainability and fashion. Uh, I love the handmade movement. I find myself at thrift stores buying all the old things and turning all the old things into lots and lots of new things. I do a lot of uh, segments about sustainability and fashion. Talk about sustainability and design when it comes to costume designing and it comes to sort of, you know, education. Where, do, where are you at with all that? So I think it's it's hard in the theater world. I will say the theater world is is not quite there yet in sustainability um, because you are putting you're creating something new constantly. You know, at the last theater I managed, we did nine shows a season, so that's a lot of shows. Um, you can reuse some things, but I would say we're not quite there yet. But when we can be reusing things, thrifting things. Like I said before, a lot of theaters will have a costume stock or like a huge warehouse of costumes and you can reuse them. And something that a lot of people don't know is when you make costumes, you tend to put a lot more seam allowance in them than mm -hmm. uh, your normal clothes. So when right. you're sewing from a sewing pattern, your seam allowance might be five eighths of an inch. When you buy a shirt in the world, you only have this tiny seam allowance. There's not much to let out. When you make something for cost for show, you might put two inches of seam allowance in a costume. And that means it can be reused. It can be adjusted. Um, so I think in that way, mm -hmm. we do very well because we can reuse things and we can alter them. So there's a lot of finding something that already exists, altering it. We're taking a costume that has been built before and changing it, maybe adding a different trim, changing a sleeve, shortening it. So there's a lot of things you can do to keep using stuff we already have. And with the way that theaters, you know, after pandemic, I feel like budgets have gotten smaller. A lot of people are doing that just because they have to. So it does go towards, you know. Yeah, I love for the environment. <laughs> sure. It's that reuse, recycle, repurpose, refashion. And certainly the warehouses do help. I mean, a lot of times in any, you know, sewing, even for me, if I'm, you know, buying jeans from the thrift store and I'm going to turn them into a wraparound skirt, I might need to buy something new to add to it, what have you. Um, but I, I do think that the idea is there, especially with theater because you because of that seam allowance because you can put it in a warehouse because you can give it to the next person over or mm -hmm. down at the other theater and reuse it again so we're all there um and we think about it a lot right yeah absolutely i mean i think we're always trying to at least for me as manager I, i'm always trying to think of well do, don't we have a pair of black pants downstairs like we, you know we've what can we start with that we already have um and if it's not a dance show, shoes can be reused again. A lot of times we'll like resole shoes um, to keep using them. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of that. I live my life whenever possible. Things. Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. I have shoes that are like 30 years old. I just keep putting new soles on them. That's <laughs> I'll give that tip out to the world. Find yourself a good cobbler. <laughs> like, Find yourself everyone a good cobbler. Yeah. should have a shoe person because then you can buy nice shoes and you just keep resoling them and using them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great. Yeah. Have a what? shoe person. <laughs> they can paint the bottom any color you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're slippery. They can add rubber. Like a shoe per yeah, a cobbler can do a lot for your shoes. So, so great. I love a good cobbler. All right. Let's talk about innovations in technology. We know they're always changing, not only in our, you know, working world and our personal world, but also in this world of sewing uh, and costume design and fabrication. Talk about some of these innovations in technology and how they are affecting costume design and in fabric fabrication, designing fabrics. Yeah. So a few things, um, and pattern, you making know, too. 
Pattern making. Yeah. So I was going to say one big thing that has impacted me the most is sewing with a projector. So you can get a projector to project your pattern onto your fabric instead of using paper patterns. Uh, and that is also sustainable. Sure. So that's a big bonus there. Yeah. Um, but it's more efficient. Uh, it's faster um, to project your pattern just directly on your fabric and cut. Um, so I'd say that is for me right now, like the biggest one. And I have been sewing with a projector for years and years and years. Um, and I love it. It just makes things faster. If you are good at illustrator, you can also adjust a pattern and directly, you know, shine it onto your fabric. You don't have to reprint your pattern or repurchase a pattern. Um, so I really love that. Uh, that's a big thing. And I'd say sewing machines are getting fancier. You can do a lot more that you used to not be able to mm -hmm. do like embroidery and things like that. Um, they're getting stronger. So sewing through, if you're a costume designer, you're sewing through heavy brocades and things yeah. at some point in your career, probably most of it. So being able to sew those heavier fabrics, I think machines are getting stronger. Um, yeah. And then I've seen Something, my husband is a lighting designer. So in the oh. past, we've actually worked on projects together to integrate lights into costumes. And cool. I haven't done a lot of that recently, but uh, I know that there's a lot of technology out there with lit fabrics and, yeah. you know. They put the LED lights right in it. Exactly. And so there's right cool through. stuff like that that gets, yeah. you know, now that it's an option, you can actually do. Tell us about Ditto because you mentioned it and I want everyone to know what that is. Yeah. So Ditto is a sewing projector. It's a whole system. So it's a projector on a mounted beam that you can set up in your sewing room or your dining room, wherever you sew. Um, and it comes with, it works with an app. So your patterns are actually on your phone and you can project them so that the app kind of just talks to the projector, sends your patterns down for you to project. And the really cool thing about Ditto is that, uh, the patterns are customizable to your measurements. So not only do you get to project them, but you get to adjust them before projecting them um, to your measurements. So that makes them even more efficient. <laughs> I love it. So ding, ding, quick little plug there for, you know, um, we're, we're really focusing on this idea of, of costume design, um, even fashion design. What's your advice for aspiring costume designers, what would you tell somebody just starting out that thinks I want to go into costume design or I want to be a uh, create fabric? So I think there's a few ways to go about it. And I will tell you the way that I got into it. Cause I think again, there's different ways to go about things. Mm -hmm. Uh, what worked for me was sewing in costume shops. That's mm -hmm. how you network. That's how you meet people. That's how you get experience in how, a costume production from start to finish works, how, you know, you get to work with designers, you get to work with managers, you get to understand the whole process. So for me, right out of school, I uh, got, I did go to school for costume design, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, I mean, proud of my degree and I think it helped, but uh, I think if someone, if you know how to sew and you're excited about this and you, they ha you have the creativity then you can get into costume design. You can get into costume sewing. So I would say reach out to local theaters, see if they need help. If you can put in a zipper, if you can hem some pants, someone will need your help. Um, so that's how I got started. I started, I apprenticed after college at a theater in Philadelphia. Uh, and I kind of learned, you know, mm -hmm. sewing on nine something shows constantly changing different shows, understanding how the process works, how different styles of shows work, um, and meeting people. Cause I met directors, I met the actors, I met designers. Um, and a lot of the theater world is, uh, you probably know is word of mouth. So right. networking is huge. <laughs> network, um, network, network. That's what I learned in college. <laughs> yeah. And you never know, like, it's not just about, oh, I need to meet this director or an actor might mention your name, be like, oh, I worked with this person at this right. theater. You should contact them. Yeah. And for me, a lot of my, it's being in a group of costume design friends. If one of us gets offered a show, but mm -hmm. can't do it, we'll send the name of our little group to be like, hey, here's the people I recommend. That's great. So yeah, I would say so. I find that it was a lot easier for me to get design jobs because I could sew and I met people than just trying to just design. However, there's people that don't sew. So you can totally get out there and 
just to write a design. I'm just saying from my experience, being able to sew and tailor really got me started. And, um, I had, I freelanced for several years and I was constantly working. So, um, yeah, make friends. <laughs> I love Learn it. Learn sew I, and make friends. <laughs> listen, I mean, that's, I spent a lot of money going to school in my, I, I majored in public relations and I, I, I minored in, in, um, I, I guess it would be, it wasn't sewing, but it was like, uh, like sewing theory or something like that. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, but we were sewing a lot. So, um, but my, what I, my biggest takeaway for that was network, 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 contacts, contacts, contacts. I say I paid a lot of money to learn those two words and say them both three times. So thank you, Dr. Kapersky. But when you're, you're, you are an educator as well, you're teaching classes. What is your uh, philosophy when you're teaching uh, aspiring sewists? And what are the, the core skills that you really try to make sure that your students are walking away with? Yeah. So I want to go back real quick and tell people just to give a little confidence boost. Do not be afraid to cold email and call people. Like the worst they can do is say, uh, sorry, we don't have any stitcher positions or we're not looking for a designer at this time. Th don't feel bad. It's just business, but don't feel afraid to put yourself out there and just tell people you're available. You never know what's going to come. And that kind of leads into your question about what I tell my students is have that confidence. Don't be afraid. Like, you know, don't feel like everything has to be perfect before you start marketing yourself as a costume designer. Be confident in your sewing because I I teach a lot of sewing, obviously. Right now mm -hmm. I teach sewing online with Ditto. Um, I do a lot of their tutorials and how to's. Mm -hmm. And then I also teach at a university in Philadelphia and I'll teach pattern making and corsetry and tailoring. And the biggest thing with my students is, you know, that confidence. I'm like, you know how to do this. You, you know how to sew this. So just do it. And, you know, everything will follow if you're, you know, confident. And I know building that confidence is hard, but you build that confidence by keep doing it. So keep practicing. Um, right. You know, if you're not that great at sewing a zipper, just keep doing a few at home until you feel better about it. And then when someone asks you, can you sew a zipper? You can easily say, yes, I can sew a zipper. I so, yeah, I, I think just be a little more confident in what you're doing. Try new things, you know. Now, with that, I do not believe in fake it until you make it. I think, you know, if you don't you know, how to, know how to do zipper, it, yeah. someone will notice. But yeah. I think uh, <laughs> ask questions and try at home, like just practice. Um, that's how you build your confidence in sewing, in design. Like if you don't, if you want to get into costume design, but you don't really have any theaters to work in, just start drawing, draw, you know, pick a show, practice making a mood board. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll build your portfolio that you can send out to theaters too. So it's all towards something and just, you know, work towards it. <laughs> Do you have to be a great uh, sketch artist or a drawer to uh, be a designer? No, I um, draw pretty well because I, you know, have a fine arts background. Um and I've actually been hired by other designers to draw their renderings. Oh, so you oh. can mm -hmm. job that out. You can also make just mood boards. I know a lot of now, now that there's so much digital software, I know designers who just Photoshop like the faces of an actor onto a body oh, yeah. with these pants. Like you can kind of do that. So no, you do not need to draw. You don't necessarily need to even sew. However, I think it does help. Because I agree. We'll I... understand how fabrics work, how they feel, how they look. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that. So. I totally agree. I also think if you're an interior designer, you should also be able to sew fabrics together because of the different weight, the structures, the what they're made out of, all that things. We could say what looks good, but I want you to know how to use it, you know, and exactly. put it together and how they work together. But it's and funny, I ask you about this, the drawing because when my husband and I watch a lot of fashion competition shows on TV. We watch all of them. Um, and he's like, they're all such great artists. I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. They all can draw. I, I really, I can draw my idea, but it's not a beautiful sketch. That's why I asked. I kind of asked for me. Yeah. No, you don't need to. <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love your words of wisdom. Don't be afraid to make that cold call. And I think that really can um, be part of your life in general, whether you're looking for that new job, whether you're looking to pivot, whether you're looking and starting your career, if you're a kid, 
whatever it is, don't be afraid to make that cold call or just don't be afraid because what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, a, a few years ago, I maybe wouldn't have said that because I was the very type of person. Again, I'm a shy person. It might not come off, but I, <laughs> I am <laughs> all that theater you know, not into. introverted <laughs> and I'm a backstage person. Um, but it, when during the pandemic, if it wasn't for cold emailing, I would have never gotten a fabric right. uh, line out into the world. So that was a positive experience. And for that one, there's been many, many more where I've gotten a no. And I, you get used to it. Honestly, the more no's you get, the easier they come. And then you really don't care. <laughs> so, yeah, you're like, okay, moving on. Next So one. it's like the first few will be hard. But just like, remember, it's not personal. And like, it doesn't hurt to try. Mm -hmm. The best thing that, that's going to happen is they're going to say yes and you get what you want. And the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no and you're going to move on. So yeah, just like try it and put your stuff out in the world and see what happens. I want to just be in your world for one entire day from the beginning to the end and do all the fun things that you do. Uh, Amanda, tell us how everyone can get in touch with you if they need a little bit more inspiration or they're just curious or they want to find your fabrics or they want to see more of your designs. Where can we find you? Yeah. So my name's Amanda Todaro. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Amanda Todaro Sews. Uh, if you're looking for my, and you'll also look up Amanda Todaro for costume design. Um, I have a website for that. And then if you want to find my fabric designs or patterns, uh, my business is called Cotton Stitches Co. So you can look up Cotton Stitches Co on Instagram or my website to find all that or on Spoonflower. So all over the place. <laughs> so all we need to know is that you are Amanda Tadaro. We can find you on Spoonflower, Instagram. We go to your website, amandatadaro.com, and we can get it all right there. Amanda Tadaro, you are amazing. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us on Creative Living. Thank you, Jane. I loved being here. This was fun. Live better creatively. For more inspiration, visit janeklaus.com. Thank you for listening.